This is chapter 1 of Chem 102. This recording will be at a much faster pace than a typical lecture. However, it will contain the, uh, the basic content needed to understand what's in this chapter. So, in this chapter 1, you learn a lot about portable electronics. You're going to learn why your cell phone works at the end of the day. And so, what, what are the different components in your portable electronic devices made from? What role do metals play in electronic devices? How is sand converted into glass? And how can its, stru its structure be modified for crack resistant screens? Again, like screens in your cell phones. What environmental implications of fabricating and recycling your portable electronic devices? Because there are consequences to, re to not, frankly, not recycling uh, these devices. And you will learn a lot about that. Again, the pace of this particular recording is a bit faster than you would actually get in the live lecture. Let's start with the periodic table. The periodic table uh, is essentially the Bible of four chemists. It contains the elements, the known elements, and uh, we show you here in an organized fashion how these elements are related, and they're basically related by the electronics. Electronics is what really drives their position on a periodic table, electronic being the number of electrons, and protons, and neutrons, and electrons, particularly the number of electrons uh, in the element, and they're organized according to the number of protons, which is the atomic, atomic number. So it's the electronics of the element determines its position on the periodic table, and that's the real bottom line here. And now, it's organized by way of its columns, which are the groups, and so we have 1 through 18 groups, and if you notice below there, you have these 2A, 2B, Bs, these are special groupings. And if you take an upper level chemistry course, you'll get more into those, particularly in the analytical chemistry as well. So, but in Freshman Chem 102, we tend to talk about the groups 1 through 18. Uh, then we have the roles. The roles are, uh, are the periods, and they go up and down the periodic table. And if you just count them through, you have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 of those. So you have these periods. And so the, these periods go, um, are, the, are the roles. Now, when we, let's go back to the column. When we consider the columns, if we know what's happening for one element in the column, we can surmise or, or assume that similar properties or similar events might happen for others in that same column. So for the most part, an element in a column has similar properties. That is a take-home point you want to hang on to. The elements in a similar column um, have similar properties. Now returning back to the, to the rows, when it comes to the rows, what we find is that the number of electrons in the uh, elements increases from left, left to right. So we have more electrons uh, in elements going from left to right and top to bottom. So electrons increase, and because they increase, that gives them a different, uh, they have different properties, particularly in terms of how they react and, and uh, interact. You're going to learn later about what's called valence electrons. It's going to be a very important principle. So when we look at a periodic table, we look at the organization by way of columns, which are the, which uh, 1 through 18. We look at the row, the columns, which are groups, 1 through 18. We look at the rows, 1 through 7, which are the periods. periods. We also look at whether or not we have metals, which is the predominant species on the periodic table, and we have nonmetals. These are the two major groupings that, that we have. So we have these metals, and then we have these, uh, these non-metals non on, the, on the periodic table, okay? Now, we also have a very special group, which is uh, important to your cell phones, portable electronics, and all types of electronics, what we call the metalloids. And this is along what's called the, chemo the uh, periodic table diagonal. And you see it's shown on this diagram in, in a gray color, okay? So on this periodic table, we have the green color, which are the metals, and that's the predominant species, uh, form of elements uh, on the periodic table. And then we have the nonmetal, which is shown in blue, and they're to the far, mostly to the far right. And then joining between the metals and the nonmetals are the metalloids. And these metalloids are very important for electronic properties, and that's a take-home point that you want to hang on to. So the periodic table is composed mostly of metals, then we have nonmetals, then the small group of metalloids. Next, let's turn to classification of matter. When we look at the classification of matter, and we show you on this, on this diagram uh, here uh, what these classifications look like, 
Well, let's start by, by reading through the, uh, through the verbiage on the right, okay? So we have classification of metal. metal. Huh. So we have classification of matter. The four components of matter are solids, liquids, gas, and plasma. These are the four that we deal with in, uh, in freshman chemistry and 102 chemistry for non-majors. Matter can be divided into pure substances and, and mixtures. We're going to look at the diagram on the left and talk about it in more detail. Pure substances may be elements containing atoms of some type, for instance, silicon, or compounds containing two or more different types of atoms, for example, silicon dioxide. Okay? And then we have mixtures. Mixtures may be heterogeneous with a composition that varies throughout, uh, such as gravel, or homogeneous with a uniform composition throughout, such as solutions of sugar dissolved in water. Now, what does all of this mean? Let's look at what it means by looking at the diagram on the left. Again, this lecture is at a faster pace than would normally be in the live lecture. So let's look at matter. So we start here with matter and we're going to move up. We have liquids, gases, solids, and plasma, or the, or the types of uh, matter that we, that we talk about. And each are characterized by how uh, their atoms are distributed. Are distributed. Um, and so, for example, uh, liquids are closer compact than gases, okay? And uh, gases are less compact than solids, um, okay? As a matter of fact, had I drawn, drawn this chart, I would have drawn a little bit differently than this author, but this was his, his particular choice. But we basically start with, we would start with, with solids, which are more compact than liquids, which are more compact than gases, which are more compact than, than plasma. So these are the order, and these are four, and you will have to memorize these. So we have solids, liquids, gases, and plasma. And then we have matter. We have this matter can be split into pure substance. Now here's a take-home point that you never want to lose sight of. If it's on the periodic table, it's a pure substance. That's it. Period. If it's a compound that you can make from elements on the periodic table, it's a pure substance. So you should never miss pure substance because they come from the periodic table. You take a look at the periodic table, and if you see it on there, it's a pure substance. If it's a compound that you can make easily from materials on the periodic table, it's also a pure substance, okay? Then we have these mixtures. Mixtures are simply compounds or materials or bodies of matter that you put together, and if you can easily separate them, they're heterogeneous, okay? If you can take a pair of tweezers and pull them out, they're heterogeneous. Or if you sometimes sift, somehow sift them out, they're heterogeneous. However, homogeneous, you can't really tell that the other material is in there. Like when you put sugar in, uh, in water and dissolve it in water, you can't tell the sugar's there. If you make, put salt in your soup, you can't really see, see the salt. So that's called homogeneous. All right? Heterogeneous would be like, uh, like chocolate chip cookies. Okay? Heterogeneous, I mean, yeah, heterogeneous would be like chocolate chip cookies. Homogeneous, not a perfect example, would be more like sugar cookies before you sprinkle the sugar on top, okay? So you have heterogeneous, easily separated. Homogeneous requires more effort to separate. We have elements and compounds that are pure substance. Mixtures are heterogeneous or homogeneous. Moving on to the next slide. So looking at these classifications of matter, let's take a look at some examples. So we say classify each of these as elements, each of these as element, a compound, or a mixture. And so we have the answers given to you just for teaching purposes. By the way, if, if it's in bold, you'll have to memorize that definition. Okay? So, all right? So take a look at the definition at the bottom of the slide first. A molecule is a fixed number of atoms held together by chemical bonds in a certain spatial array. In other words, we have molecules. That means these are, these are, uh, are, are atoms. And these atoms have bonds between them, which fixes them in a, sp in a particular spatial array. All right? They have a certain orientation. All right? So now when we look at classifying this matter of which compounds belong and which molecules belong, we classify these carbon dioxide, Okay, um, is a molecule. So this is a molecule of 
carbon dioxide because it's a fixed number of atoms held together in chemical bonds of special array. You get it? All right, so that's what so that's what this molecule is. So it's a compound. So carbon dioxide is classified as a compound. And it's a compound uh, because it's composed of two pure substances from the periodic table. Then we have nickel. It's an element. It's single on the periodic table. It, it is not combined with something else that we can find on the periodic table. Then we have ammonia. This is a compound. This, all right, we have a molecule of, of ammonia. It's a compound because we have nitrogen and hydrogen. Okay? Water is also a compound because we have hydrogen and oxygen. In other, on the other hand, fluorine is an element. Why? On the periodic table, let's go back to periodic table. On the periodic table, things that are located in group 17 are called diatomic, which means that in their natural state, they exist as a dimer or two units of this element. Now, keep in mind, I'm starting off this chapter with really simple terms that will be refined as we move forward. Okay, so I want to be sure in chapter one that we introduce you to concepts. So some of the terms are going to be really simple terms or simplified forms and, or, of, of what really uh, these materials and elements and compounds look like. But as you go on to later chapters, we will refine that and show you better what it looks like, all right? So we have, in group 17, we have fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, etc., that are called diatomics, which means that they exist as F2, Cl2, Br2, and so on and so forth. They are called diatomics. That is their natural state. They naturally exist not as F, not as a single, but as a double, as a dimer, as a twin, F2. Okay, the two at the bottom, the suffix at the bottom uh, tells you that. Two other elements on the periodic table that exist in nitrogen exists naturally as N2, and oxygen exists as O2. You'll want to memorize these diatomics. They, you will uh, see them again uh, throughout the rest of this course. So we have these diatomics on the periodic table. And therefore, when we talk about the element fluorine, F2 is an element, oxygen is O2 is an element, and nitrogen is also an element. So is N by itself, O by itself, F by itself. But its natural state it exists as a what we call a diatomic. Okay? All right? All right. Sodium chloride, back to this table. Back to classification matters. Sodium chloride is a compound because it's composed of sodium and chlorine. Now, soap is a mixture because there are various organic compounds that we blend together until we get it. If you blend it together to make it, it's a mixture. When you bake a cake, you, you have a mixture. Most foods come out to be, many of the foods that are made will, will, be, will be mixtures, okay? And yeah, they'll be homogeneous or heterogeneous. Seawater is salt dissolved in water. It's a mixture. <coughs> Excuse me. And seawater is a, well, yeah, seawater, for the most part, where you swim on the beach is a, is a homogeneous uh, mixture. It tends to be homogeneous when you're swimming. Okay? All right, so there you have it. These are examples of classifications of matter. Now, these classifications uh, go further than this. We have atoms, the building blocks of matter. And so you're going to hear us use atoms, molecules, and matter a lot. And occasionally we're going to use it interchangeably. You'll learn when to differentiate uh, between their, their meaning. Okay, and we'll try to go slow as we, as we do this so that you get familiar with the terms. Okay, so for, one of the pur purposes of chapter one is to introduce you to the basic concepts and familiarize you with the terms. Okay, so atoms, the building blocks of matter. Okay, now let's start by with the, uh, with the diagram. Again, we know the molecules, a fixed number of atoms held together by chemical bonds and a chemical special array. That is an important part of the definition. Okay? So now, let's look at this diagram. We've already exposed you to what matter is. It's solid, liquids, and gas. And I told you if I had organized this table, I would have organized it a little bit different. Perhaps I'll change this version at some point. So, here we have matter. 
This matter is pure substance and mixtures. We've already introduced that. Elements, compounds, heterogeneous, and homogeneous. We've introduced those concepts on previous slides. So let's take this down further. Let's drop to the bottom of this slide, the bottom of this diagram, where we have atoms. Atoms are the building blocks of matter. So all the matter is built upon atoms. These atoms, if we go straight up the diagram, become molecules. Okay? These molecules have what we call molecular structure. So we have atoms that build molecules. Okay, we know molecules. <coughs> and we know that molecules uh, have a fixed number of atoms held together in a special arrangement. Uh, and they make, yeah, so we make molecular structures that way. Now, atoms also have, have ionic structure, okay? They are ions. When we look at a periodic table, each of these elements uh, can exist as ions. Those ions are what we call, are said to be ionic, okay? So ions are ionic. Molecules make molecular structures. You get it? So these are the basic building blocks of matter. These molecular structures and these ionic structures are what build compounds. So compounds can be either molecular or, or ionic. That's a take-home point. Okay, you got it? Compounds can be molecular or they can be ionic. That is a take-home point. These molecular ionic compounds come from ions and mo molecules, both of which come from atoms. So let's read through the verbiage on the, on the right, and I'll do that. Ionic compounds are composed of oppositely charged ions. So we have these ions that are positive charged and negative charged. Okay, those are opposite charged ions. So when we think of ionics, we think of positive charges and negative charges. Electrons are either added or subtracted from the atoms to form ions. You'll learn more about how to do that and exactly what that means in some of the other lectures to come. But suffice it to say, if we go back to the periodic table, all of these elements have a fixed number of, of electrons. If we remove an electron, it becomes a, a more positive ion. If we add an electron, it becomes a more negative ion, okay? In the case of, for example, lithium, if we remove one electron, it becomes a plus ion. If we take, if we take uh, in the case of fluorine, and we remove, and we add an electron, okay, it becomes a negative ion, follow? So that's how, that's how we produce the ions, and that's what having ionic structure means. You'll learn more about that as it comes. Again, chapter one introduces a lot of concepts that we're going to talk in more detail in chapters to come. Molecular compounds are composed of molecules which are made up of atoms. In other words, there are no ions here. It's simply the, the mo molecules come together in a neutral, essential and neutral state, but you'll learn more about how the valence electrons allow that to happen and uh, they form these compounds. For example, carbon dioxide dries. Carbon monoxide is uh, the silent killer, uh, CO. Okay. All right. Whereas the four states of matter, whereas the four states of matter, elements, compounds, and mixtures are on the microscopic scale, meaning they're very large. You can see them. Okay. Individual molecules, ions, and atoms on the submicroscopic, microscopic, MIC, or nanoscale, you cannot see them with your, with your eyes. So we have the MAC, micro large scale forms of matter, and then we have the microscopic scales of matter. If you can see it, it's the micro scale. If you can't see it, it's the MIC, micro nano scale of matter. And that's how matter exists. So we have matter. Let's, re let's recap this thing. We have matter that exists in solid, liquid, gas, and plasma. This solid, liquid, gas, plasma matter can be pure substances or, or mixtures. The pure substance can be elements and compounds. These elements and compounds come from molecular or ionic structures for molecules, ions, which all come from 
atoms. These, the mixtures in, of matter can be heterogeneous, which can be easily separated. It doesn't take much effort to do it. They, uh, you can see that you can basically see and detect that they're different. In the case of homogeneous, you can't see or detect easily that they're different. It's a, uh, the solution is there, and uh, you can't see the other species or easily detect them. Now, when elements come together and form compounds, they form that by exact ratios. Okay? Carbon dioxide is CO2. Carbon monoxide is CO. Those are exact ratios. The small subscripts at the bottom, which you now get familiar with, determines the number of atoms or, or, or the elemental count of each of the species in the compound. And there's a law, this, and it's called the law of multiple proportions. Elements may combine in a variety of integral ratios to form multiple compounds, each with a different property. In other words, the same elements can combine in different ways to give you different com compounds that have the same elemental composition, but that elemental composition is put together at a different ratio, and therefore we have different properties. For example, Fe3O4, okay, magnetite, uh, we show you here, uh, which shown at the top. Uh, it uh, has magnetic properties. And then iron, Fe203, shown here at the bottom, uh, is rust. It does not have magnetic properties. So we have Fe304 has magnetic properties, and Fe203, it, it, it does not have it. Both are iron oxides but have very different physical properties such as magnetism, okay? So we can go, we can take iron and oxygen, combine together, and we can make rust, or we can make a magnet. Moving on. This brings us to the subatomic particles, and you will learn a lot about how to count these. We do math sessions, and when we do the math section, sessions, that's when we will go into more details on exactly how to count and do the math for these. In the lecture part, we're going to take you through the lecture material, and then we're going to go into details when we have our, our, our math set sessions on this. All right? We'll talk about subatomic particles. We have subatomic particles are divided in what we call protons, neutrons, and electrons. Positively charged, neutral, and negative charged subatomic particles. These are basically subatomic, meaning very, very small uh, particles, okay, that have charges. Okay, protons, we show you the, the mass here, is 10 to the minus 27. Neutrons are 10 to the minus 27. Electrons are 10 to the minus uh, 31. For this reason, because of this mass in, in kgs, we don't consider electrons when we do uh, uh, the mass of, of elements, or, okay, the mass of the element. So in other words, electrons do not contribute to mass in freshman chemistry, okay? So when we have to consider mass, we only consider protons and neutrons. That's a take-home point that you want to hang on to when it comes to subatomic particles. It's protons and neutrons together that gives you the mass. That's why you show the electrons show the relative mass is zero. And again, for freshman chemistry, this holds, holds true. Uh, well, it holds true, period, but there are areas of research that will use, uh, that will deal with electrons, okay? And they're small contributions to mass, but not in freshman chemistry. So here we have protons and neutrons that contribute to mass. Electrons don't contribute to mass, but what electrons contribute to is volume and size, basically the size of the, uh, of the, uh, of the particles, okay? So looking at the diagram, we'll show you an example here. We have this diagram where the electrons are circling around what's called a nucleus. The nucleus is composed of protons and neutrons, okay? So we have protons and we have the neutrons. They're located in the nucleus. That's it. Within the nucleus, we only have protons and neutrons. The nucleus, then, is what contributes to the mass. What you call weight is not weight, but the mass of the... Uh, of the element. 
in this case proton neutrons shown here. Then the electrons can contribute to the size. So the diagram does a reasonably decent job of doing that. So we have the size contributed electrons. Let's take a look at, at hydrogen. In the case of hydrogen, we have only protons here. Okay, there are no neutrons. So the contribution of mass is simply based upon the number of protons. So in the nucleus of hydrogen, we only have a proton. And surrounding this hydrogen atom uh, um, is an electron. So we have proton, okay, which has a mass, relative mass of one. So, and we have electron, which does not have a relative mass, but it has a charge of minus one. Okay? So that's what we have for hydrogen. Now, the concept may be better understood when we move to helium. So take a look at helium. In helium's case, if you look at the nucleus, we have two protons, right, in helium. And we have two neutrons. And, by the way, we have two electrons. So it's simply making a count. So the mass here is contributed from the, from the, from the two protons and the, and, the two, and the two neutrons. We don't get mass from the two electrons. Okay, and again, you're going to see how we count this and how we do the math for this. But one key point you want to hold on to right now and remember is this. Protons are used as the key characteristic of each element on the, on the periodic table. In other words, each element on the periodic table has a very specific number of protons, which is equal to their atomic number. Okay? All right, let's read the verbiage here. As seen in these data, most of the mass in the atom is found in the nucleus. Protons and neutrons are found in the nucleus. That's it. That's where the mass is. So hang on to that. The electrons are located outside the nucleus. There are no electrons in the nucleus. Note that the value of the relative mass of the electrons is listed as zero when rounded to its nearest whole number. The electron does indeed have mass, though very small. So for freshman chemistry, we consider it as zero. All right. Again, if you move on to upper level, level science, you'll see where, where these values get used, particularly in, research, in fundamental research. All right? Enough on subatomic particles. Let's talk about electricity. Electricity is defined as the flow of electrons from one location to another. That is a critical definition. Okay? It's the flow of electrons from one, flow of electrons from one location to another. All right? And here's how it does it. It uses metals... Okay, because they're electrically conductive. Okay? They're actually thermally conductive as well, but they're electrically conductive. So if they're electrically conductive, what happens is the electrical conductivity uh, allows the movement of electrons in a 3D structure. So essentially, the electrons are running around the wires in the building. Okay? In a, so they look, they take a 3D path. So it's 3D, it's like ants running along a tube or running along stalks of grass. They're running along, the electrons are flowing around and around. They go around the, around the building until they see a, see a light. They see a light, it glows because of resistance against it, and it glows, and you get the lights that you see in your classroom. And this is what electricity is. It is the flow of electrons from one location to another. And when you throw the switch off, it stops that flow of electrons. You turn it on, it can complete the circuit through a flow of electrons from one location to, in that, to another. Got it? That's electricity. That's simple. Hang on to that definition. When we talk about all these materials and minerals that we have, um, we look primarily at the Earth's crust to see where we get them from, and you'll want to memorize this slide and be familiar with it. Uh, the material's primary source of metals, earth crust, mostly composed of oxygen, silicon, and aluminum, and alkali and alkali earth metals. Alkali and alkali earth metals, we go back to the periodic table. These are your group one alkali and group two alkali earth metals. Okay? So alkali, alkali earth metals, group one, group two on the periodic table. And then we have all these other metals that we see on the periodic table shown in green in this particular diagram or in this particular for this particular author. So here we show you the distribution here. Not much else to really say about this except this other is where we get a lot of other materials. So you know as you get to your group one and group two from here about 11 percent 
and iron's a big part of the metals and aluminum is, and then the re then for the most part, most of the other metals in the periodic table come from this 1%. They're very small, but they make a really strong contribution to, to our way of life and to the science we use. By the way, one of the things you'll learn in this course is how this relates to normal everyday life. So you'll hear me using a lot of examples in that regard. So this is where we get these minerals from, minerals from, from the earth. Sand is a pretty interesting one. Sand goes to silicon, which is the metal in your cell phones. Hema Semiconductor is one of the world leaders in manufacturing of the silicon metal that's used in most uh, portable electronics. It, we, this is done by what's called an oxidation process. And again, in our work sessions, we go through this in more details. We will actually work through all of these uh, equations on all the math related to this. In the lecture, we're going to take you through the lecture, and then we're going to work through it in work sessions. All right? So here we have oxidation. And you can't have oxidation with dot reduction. Oxidation is electrons removed from a metal. So you have a metal that has electrons on it because it's on the periodic table. You remove those electrons, it's oxidized. Here we show you what's called a balanced equation, which you will learn how to do. Don't fret, don't stress yet. We're going to teach you how to do this. We're going to walk through all of this in work sessions. Okay? So for now, we use this example. We have aluminum plus oxygen, and oxygen is diatomic. Note the small two here. That's the elemental state. And it gives us, okay, aluminum, okay? It's oxidized. It gives us this aluminum oxide, okay, which is a solid. And essentially what happened in this case is we started with aluminum in its elemental state. That's what the zero means. And we, we remove three electrons because that's what was required to complete this chemistry. The movement of these three electrons was required to complete the chemistry of taking it from, this sol from the solid aluminum and the gaseous oxygen to the aluminum oxide. So we oxidize this by three electrons. That's how we read this. So we have aluminum, which has been oxidized by three, by removing three electrons. And because we remove them, we write them as a plus on the right side of the balance equation. You will learn this. Don't fret it yet. And then we have reduction. Electrons added to a, to a metal compound. So we have a metal, and we add these electrons to it, and we get a negative charge. This is called uh, carbothermic reduction. This is used to make the metal, this is used to make the, the uh, crude metal the, that's used, that's further refined to make the hyperpure metal in your cell phones. Okay? All right? That's what we have happening here. So we take the silicon plus carbon, 1,000 degrees, to get C carbon monoxide, which is poisonous gas, so it has to be vented properly and handled properly, plus your solid silicon. And this is called, this is your raw silicon here. Okay, this gives you silicon metal um, that's further, further used, further refined to make metal for your cell phone. What happened here was we had silicon that was to which was added four electrons to take it to its elemental state. Okay, follow? So silicon, because of its position on the periodic table, is considered, its position gives it a plus four. So we need to do this, we need to uh, add four electrons to take it to a zero state. You will learn how to do all of this. Suffice to say for now, we have sand and silicon, it's oxidation and reduction. We, uh, we remove electrons and we add electrons to get you to materials that we can use to manufacture and make materials that we enjoy in our daily living. Okay? This shows that further purification of that silicon. Okay? And we show you this process just to be sure that you're exposed to it, where we take silicon and it's added to hydrogen chloride gas, and we get this really pure saline material. Okay? We then take that and we re- solidify the silicon, we basically reduce it back, the silicon, okay? We basically oxidize the silicon, 
and then we reduce the silicon again, oxidize in step one, and then we reduce the silicon in step two, and voila, we get this really pure material called 12N, and that's the take-home message on this slide for, fre for, right, for freshman chemistry. The bottom line is we oxidize and re we use oxidation and reduce, and re a, the bottom line is we use an oxidation and reduction process to get us to hyperpure silicon, which we call 12N purity. You must hang on to that 12N purity. That is critical. 12 impurity silicon is what we use in your cell phones. Okay? We're not going to talk right now about scientific notation. But suffice, we're going to go into the details of this in our math work sessions. But we write these digits in scientific notation because it helps us uh, to be able to communicate it a lot quicker and it gives us orders of magnitude about the size uh, and the impact of the values. So that's the importance of scientific notation. It also helps us be able to visually see what the sign, uh, sig significant figures are. All these terms you'll, you'll learn later in the math work sessions, but suffice to say scientific notation is how we write digits in, in chemistry. How pure is this hyperpure? Well, we just show you here in these in this slide. We just show you here what this hyperpure silica means in this slide. And this is author's depiction of it. It's equivalent to stacking 170 stacks of yellow tennis balls, right? Uh, make 170 separate stacks of yellow tennis ball from Earth to the moon. Okay? and put in one red ball, and that's how pure it has to be, okay? It's almost equivalent, frankly, of three grains of sand in a wheelbarrow. Three, three grains of, of red sand in a, barrel, in a wheelbarrow of sand. So it has to be very, very pure. This diagram works for some people, some people it doesn't. I'm going to hold you to this diagram. But it's in the author's notes, and we thought we would share it with you. The bottom line is it's extremely pure, okay? And we saw by way of the digits, it's nine out, it's 12 nines, it's 99 point till you reach the 12th nine purity. One time 10 to the minus 10 in terms of purity, pretty pure. Okay? All right? So it's 10, to, it's, it's uh, 10 to the minus 10 in terms of its purity, and that's pretty pure. So, what have we learned so far? We discovered that. On the periodic table, there are lots of metals and, and uh, non-metals, and the metals are used, there's a special group of metals that are used in the semiconductor industry, actually in the electronics industry altogether, and these are called metalloids. But there are many other metals that are valuable to us in terms of electronic applications. So where do we get these from? Well, we get these from various places around the world, and we like to talk about these are what we call rare earth metals, that is, metals that we dig from the ground. And these are in that small percentage of metals that are in the soil that we talked about on the previous slide. So where are the rare earth metals? Take a look at this slide. China controls most of the world's supply of rare earth metals. Hence, the U.S. is reliant on other countries' export of these diverse elements. Are there alternatives? What if the trade wars develop? So there are issues with regard to understanding uh, how governments cooperate together to get this, because at the end of the day, we need the rare earth metals. Now, the reason these rare earth metals settled there is simply because of the formation of earth. As the earth was being formed, as, as uh, land mass started to uh, evolve and land mass started to show up, several areas of the world settled in terms of metals, and that's just where they are. And as time went on, scientists discovered these metals were very, very useful, and they called them rare earth metals. In uh, the United States, one area where it's mined really heavily, frankly, for rare earth metals is in middle Georgia. Engelhart's one of the big manufacturers of these, and if you ever visit middle Georgia, you'll see these big craters just dug, dug into the ground, and big... Uh, and. Uh, what was there were actually metals, and that's where they took the metals out and they refined them, and they used them for all types of applications, including the electronic industry. So, 
one thing that we want to make sure you remember is that China is a really large producer of rare metals. So frankly, the world is dependent on China for export of these. So the governments have to cooperate. Now, what are some other uh, applications of these metals and these uh, materials in terms of electronics? Take a look at this slide, how do touch screens work? Well, this slide shows you uh, how a touch screen uh, actually works. And so uh, we'll just read through the verbiage here, then we'll walk through the diagram. A uh, touch screen contains 2D grids of metallic wires that are sandwiched between two insulated layers. Essentially, these wires are almost like sprayed on or coated on. They're actually deposited on in a particular pattern, and they have the contacts. And when you touch a cell phone, you get an interference or you get a point of contact there, and that contact reads gives you some digital printout. So if you press number two, you get the number two. Number four, you get the number four, based on where you touch the screen. Electronic current flows in the wires are stored within the multi-layer st st uh, structure, okay? The electronic current flowing in the wires are stored in the multi-layer structure. In other words, there's e there are electrons running around the wires in 3D, 3D fashion, uh, le electron flow, we know electricity the flow of electrons from one place to the other. So these electrons are flowing there, and they're flowing in a really confined space. But that's okay with electrons, because recall, electrons are mic or, or MIC, microscopic, nano. Well, they're actually below, uh, below nano. They are actually subatomic particles. So there's, these, are, these subatomic uh, electrons are flowing around in your cell phone. And when you touch it in certain places, voila, you get an output. If an inductive... If, in a, if a conductive object, such as your finger, which conducts, touches the screen, the uniformity of the stored electric field is distorted. So it's like an interference, like the field's there, it's happy, and you touch it and you interfere with it, but that's what's read. And that's, that's uh, some really smart people figure out algorithms of math and figure out how to tell you that that's a two or four or five or what have you. The location of touch is determined by a controller in the processing chip. So you have this, you have this touch screen and it touches and it causes interactions of the of the electronic components within there it distorts the field and that's read as a signal so if you look at the diagram on the left uh, it just has all these layers I really don't expect you to memorize all these layers but I really expect you to be familiar with the fact that it is uh, uh, e electric current flowing in the wires stored in these multi multi layer structures First part, you have the protective edge to reflect the coated. This is so when you look at it, the light doesn't uh, reflect off and then let you see your cell phone. So you have that. Then you have a protective coating. So these two are pretty much important for aesthetics and uh, for protection of, of below it. Then we have the bonding layer, and that's pretty important for holding the device in place, the bonding layers, and making sure that these wires are in place and in the right position so that a four is a four and a five is a five. And, and when you text out, you don't accidentally text the wrong person. Uh, there, all of that can happen. Um, so you, then you have the driving uh, lines, and then you have the sensing lines. Okay, and this is what helps you to make contact and be able to again send signals uh, from from your cell phone and from your uh, your touchscreen device. Then we have that's called a glass substrate. Then you have the L LCD display uh, uh, layers as well. So you have all these layers that build up there on top of each other. They're sealed. And now they're sealed to be waterproof. Uh, and you've seen all the commercials where people pour champagne on them, and they're waterproof. That way, we don't get, we don't destroy the uh, the electronics. But at the end of the day, this works because we have uh, we have rare earth metals in here. In fact, I think there's at least 78 different types of metals from the periodic table that are in a single cell phone. Perhaps I'll post a uh, an article on that. But about 78 different rare metals are in your cell phone alone. So these um, cell phones, this, this slide from silicon to computer chips, we have chips inside all these electronic devices. So how do we get there? Well, we get there by starting with that 12N pure material. You notice here it says 5N and 7N or 12N. It depends on the application. But the highest purity we have is 12N, and that's what the, in the electronic uh, industry really likes. Uh, and it's what you enjoy because when you press your, your, uh, your cell phone, you want to be able to press it, and as soon as you touch it, you want the person in, in 
China to get your message right away. You don't want to fret between a few milliseconds or not, right? As soon as you text, you want to text back. If you're having a text war, an argument, you want to go really smooth. Well, you want high purity materials. Okay, so you take these high purity materials and high temperature silicon is fabricated in this, these cylinders. So they make this, this rod in that Hemlock Semiconductor out of Hemlock, Michigan. They make these really large rods and they're about uh, half the size of my body or a couple of sizes of my body. But anyway, they're large rods and they're sawed. They, they take these and they send them to the cell phone manufacturers or at least the people who fabricate the parts for the cell phones and they re, they chop them, they crunch, they crush them and they re, uh, re, uh, rework them into these um, new rods or new shapes of their rods so they can saw them and then they take those saw parts and they use those to fabricate, uh, to fabricate chips. Hundreds of processing steps are used to fabricate a computer chip, hundreds, okay, on the surface of the silicon wafer. So you have the silicon wafer, so they take the wafers, they saw the wafers, into the, into the sizes, into the parts they need. Hundreds of processing steps to get there. Chips are, are removed from the wafer and tested. The, t the chips that are tested, satisfactory, are sealed and packaged. The others are often uh, discarded. In some cases, you get some rework, but this industry doesn't work very well on rework, rework uh, chips. Uh, so, uh, they're very, uh, takes a fair amount of skill, and a lot of this work is microscopic work. It's done on a microscope. Now, the bulk silicon you see in A, this is the type of silicon that it looks like, almost like B. This is A and B are the same. B is, A is really chunks of B. The one to the right of this, in this B, these are wafers where these have been sawed. Then C, D, and E is where they're processed into, uh, into chips. So this is what the process looks like. And this, is, this happens because scientists understand how to use elements from the periodic table. So here you have it inside a processing chip. Computer chips contain billions of tiny components known as transistors. These transitions are very important because this is how uh, we're able to get the signals and get the information trans, uh, transferred to us. Um, so we have these transistors used to perform calculations needed by our computers and portable electronic devices are. And so essentially at one point, your calculator, you actually not your calculator, but your cell phone probably would have taken a, a, a small building to get those, actually a large building, to get, uh, to get the number of calculation you can try and do in your, in, your cell, in your cell phone. At one point, a, a, you know, it would take uh, a building um, a fair size to house a computer to do uh, probably about only 10% of what your cell phone can now do or your calculator can do. And that's because they miniaturize these transistors, lots of chips um, to uh, been miniaturized. And you can see here, the picture here shows you a couple of the transistors on the end of this person's finger, just to give an idea of the dimensions of it. To relate how small the components of the chips are, the scale bars in the bottom electronic microscope images are comparable to, one, diameter of a, cl of a cloud of a cloud water drop, okay? All right, so the diameter of spore, human hair. These are really, really, really small. So these transistors are, are really, really small, and that's really, uh, really good science. Um, and it happens again because we understand how to take the elements from the periodic table, how to take this, convert it into a different form of matter. That form of matter can be uh, compounds and element, uh, compounds from elements, we can actually take these co uh, compounds and we can form mixtures of these compounds, either heterogeneous or homogeneous, and we can make these really nice devices that you can enjoy on your cell phone or can enjoy your social media. So this slide shows you uh, some more interesting things about sand. We call it from sand to glass. So essentially, glass is sand that's been refined so you can see through it, okay? So sand is not only used to process silicon. You know, so we take sand, we process it really, really hot in a hundred and in a thousand degrees, uh, in a thousand degree furnace with uh, with charcoal thrown in it, or actually carbon sources thrown in it, and we get the silicon metal. We take that silicon metal, we refine it to get 12 in silicon metal, and we make your cell phones. Well, what if you just want to make glass? 
So we take that same, we take sand, it was different, actually different grade of sand than we use for the cell phones. We would take that sand and uh, we melt it down and we get glass. Now, that sand, and that sand is called amorphous sand, but there's a crystalline form of sand that people like to look at, and that's where they make uh, inexpensive jewelry from, is basically quartz. So silicon dioxide is colorless sand. Colored uh, crystals are due to the presence of metals in the crystal. So if you have a silicon quartz that has a color in it, that means it has other metals in it, and that's what gives it the beauty. You enjoy the beauty, and people sell it to you because, frankly, you enjoy it. But actually, you're just buying crystalline sand. Now, we can take that crystalline sand and we can remodify it if we, if we like. Now, this is what the crystalline sand and amorphous sand looks like. So on the left slide, A, this is crystalline. Notice it's more ordered. There's, there's a, crystal, a defined crystal lattice there. And look at B. B is not quite as uniform and ordered. On the left, we have crystalline. On the right, we have amorphous. Glass is disordered solid called amorphous. You'll want to memorize that definition. And quartz sand is crystalline solid. It has an ordered 3 structure. Both have value. On the left side, the, the, the A form, the crystalline side, this is where we have the quartz that we show you back here, the purple. This is a quartz of beauty. That it has value and you use it for its value. And B, uh, more amorphous, disordered, that would be more your sand. This would be your, your, this would be your, this would be your glass, uh, glass panes and glass windows, anything glass. And so the way they make this glass, they basically take sand, they heat it again, and cools rapidly in a disordered glass. So if they heat it, if they heat it without a carbon source, carbon source means it's called uh, uh, it's a reduction process, carbothermic reduction to be specific. So you do carbothermic reduction, I mean you put carbon in the sand and you get the silicon for your cell phone. If you just heat the the sand as it is by itself and cool it quickly, you get uh, your amorphous glass, and so we just make the glass. So quartz sand has very high melting point over 1300 degrees C. So added is sodium car carbonate and sodium and calcium carbonate and magnesium carbonate are used to lower the melting point so the glass is easier to work with. In other words, instead of heating it at 1300 degrees C, we can heat it at a lower temperature when we add these uh, uh, other metal, metal ions uh, to, the, to, the cook, to the cook recipe. Now, you've probably all heard of the crack-resistant glass. So it's called Gorilla Glass, uh, and that's a trademarked uh, material, um, that it has, very, has strength. Now, most uh, this sodium is the ion. We've talked about ions already. Sodium has a plus ion. It is an alkali uh, metal in group one. Therefore, when it's oxidized, um, it will um, have a plus one charge. Um, so it, uh, it would like to essentially give up an electron, leave, lose an electron. So sodium ion in glass structure is common. That is the common structure. The common structure of glass today is sodium ion. But some really bright scientists figured out that if they replace the sodium with potassium, they will open up that lattice and actually give it a little bit more toughness than the sodium. So sodium had a more closed lattice in it. Potassium opens it up. The size of these ions matter. Potassium is a bit larger. The, and so this forms a compression layer on the surface of the glass that provides added strength. So sodium, uh, which you notice here, has a radius of 1 point, sodium has a radius of 0.97, potassium 1.33, and that, that size difference is just enough to give it this strength and patent it as Gorilla Glass. And that's what's in a lot of cell phones today. It's called Gorilla Glass, particularly if you have a more expensive uh, cell, cell phone. Okay? So if you have a more expensive cell phone, that's what you have, Gorilla Glass. Let me repeat that just to be clear. Crack-resistant gla uh, crack glass is made from replacing the sodium in the current glass with potassium which gives it a different compression layer. And that's because potassium has a larger radii, radius, sorry, larger radius than sodium. And because of that, we can create what's called Gorilla Glass. There you have it. So now this slide is, is not really one that, uh, that uh, you'd be tested on, but it's one that I just like to 
familiarize with. So take time, read through this slide a little bit, and you'll, you'll get an idea that the bottom line here is that different electronic devices have different cost structures, and that's pretty important to them, and that's why some cell phones and devices cost more than others. Uh, but the real, another real take-home message is that the amount of energy uh, that's consumed in electronic devices is pretty high, okay? Um, and so uh, we show you some comparison with the iPhone, how many kilowatts of electricity over a lifetime. You can read those for yourself, but you see the, see the values there. But let's go down to the center paragraph here where it says, center bullet point where it says, compare this with the energy contained in one gallon of gasoline. So one gallon of gasoline is on 130, right? And, so, and just take a look at what a cell phone does. So in other words, uh, you know, cell phones require a lot of energy. That is the bottom line. That's why you hear people say, make sure you unplug them, make sure you turn them down, power them down a little bit. You'll sa help save the environment. We're going to be talking later in this course about the environmental impact of our actions. But suffice it to say right now on this slide, be aware that there are cost differences and, and there are energy consumption differences. You can read the uh, actual details on your own. Again, keep in mind, uh, this lecture is moving at a faster pace than it would be in the live lecture. Uh, lecture. Okay. So as electronic devices get smaller, they consume less energy, but they're more expensive to produce. That's the take-home message. They're getting smaller. It takes a lot more to produce that because you're going to have to miniaturize it. That means you're going smaller and smaller and smaller. That requires different levels of technology, and with different levels of technology, that requires more costs. This is an important uh, concept to think about what we call cradle-to-cradle -cradle recycling. A sustainable life cycle for a portable electronic is cradle-to-cradle. -cradle. When the end of the useful, usefulness of one product okay, dovetails with the beginning of the life cycle of another product. In other words, where, this, where, you, where you're ready to toss out the bottles, if these bottles can be used for something else, that's good. Where you're ready to toss out this cell phone, if the materials in the cell phone can be used for something else, that's good because that saves the resources. But here's, a, here's really a somewhat of a shameful statistic. Over 90% of cell phones are sent to the landfills or are collected at homes. Only 3% are recycled, and that is, is, a, is really a really sad commentary. What that means is that cell phones, okay, are in landfills leaching out materials back into the water supplies and into the supplies around us. So if there's any take-home message, recycle your cell phones, take them out of the drawers, don't, and get them recycled so that this helps the environment overall. The diagram on the left I expect you at least be familiar with, but we're going to walk starting with the cell phone manufacturing fabrication. That's an expensive part and requires a lot of energy. Hemlock Semiconductor at one point was the largest uh, user of electricity, single user of electricity in the state of Michigan, and that's probably still holding. That's because of what it takes to really produce the materials that go into your cell phones. But you have the cell phone fabrication. There's cost, and notice here you have the materials going in, and those are curved arrow up to the right. You have carbon dioxide, which is a greenhouse gas that you'll learn later about. You have NOx and SOx, we call these NOx and SOx. These are, uh, are emissions can hurt the environment um, because the SOx, the NOx creates nitric acid and the SOx creates sulfuric acid, which again, acid rain. Sulfuric acid is like acid, uh, like battery acid. So that's not good for our environment. So we had the truck, we truck it out. That requires energy. And then they get used by the consumer. And what do we do? We forget to power them down. Okay, we, all right, we never give them a rest. We're always plugging them in. Everywhere we stop, we plug in, we plug in, we plug in, we plug in. So we're always using a lot of energy there. And so everything gets trucked around again. It seems it gets recycled, but only, but 90% but of cell phones are sent to the landfill. They're not recycled. This is where we can make an impact. We're using all this valuable energy, but, how, but it, and so it would be good if we could, okay, uh, recycle it. But at the same time, we have to be aware that you have landfill in a particulate matters that's produced CO2 again, VOCs, these are volatile organic, uh, this is volatile organic compounds. Uh, and these volatile organic compounds are again unhealthy for, for the environment. So there are trade offs in absolute all of this. We have trucking costs again, uh, back to materials extraction and processing. And here you try to get materials out. Those here, metal, metal ores and everything here, limestone. These are raw materials, you dig them out of the ground, but you also, again, going to create carbon dioxide, greenhouse gas, 
knots and socks. So we have this, this cycle of, of it. But the advantage of this cycle is this. We're in, we, we do our best not to re-dig up natural resources or to harm the environment as we go. So recycling is good and finding ways to go cradle to cradle uh, from the time we use it. Can we recycle some materials? It's very healthy for the environment and for us all. So that brings us to this slide, what's called the Three Pillars of Sustainability, which is a very, very important slide. You want to memorize this exactly how it is. It always shows up on any of my exams. Uh, environmental. You, environmental, one of the, the areas of environmental involved, pollution protection, natural resource uses. When we think about environment, pollution pre prevention and natural resource use is very, very important. So we have to consider how what we're doing affects the environment, okay, and what impact we're having on the environment. And then you have the social aspect of it. The social aspect is better quality of life for all members of society. Listen, this lecture is not uh, intended to sound like a oh, woe is me, or that we're against cell phones, or against clothing, against any of these things. I've been a part of helping develop many of these, particularly in terms of electronics and polymers and things of nature. I've helped develop many of them. But here's, but what we're, and so what we're saying is that we want to consider how this affects uh, society. It is, there are trade-offs. For example, I drive a big gas guzzling truck. Therefore, I plant trees, I compost, I recycle. So the key is we want, the, we want to enjoy, enjoy our way of life, but how do we help uh, as we're enjoying that way of life? And how do we balance these resources and how are we responsible with them? And how do we admit to the consequences and understand those consequences? Then the economics, fair distribution of efficient allocation of resources. Um, again, occasionally because of how these things are processed, costs get out of hand. And that happens out of hand is a relative term, frankly. But we have to consider what the economics of what we're doing, uh, and we have to consider the economics of what we're doing and how that affects the balance of life and the balance of what people like to enjoy. And so we call these the three pillars of sustainability that we have to think about. It's not a good or bad. It's not a, uh, a, a, a issue of good and evil. It's a matter of how do we balance our living in the earth so that it works for the, for, for the environment and for, for people, for society, economics, and et cetera. So we have environmental issues, we have social issues, and we have economic. And maybe we should not call them issues, but we have an environmental pillar, a social pillar, and environmental pillar. And that completes chapter one.